A young lad named Kang Han Su found himself perplexed even after a decade had passed. He mused over the puzzling reason why he, an utterly ordinary individual, was treated just like those who were deemed losers. His thoughts drifted towards the common fantasy trope of being summoned into another world to save it from impending doom, a narrative often depicted in novels and comics. Despite leading a content life on Earth as an ordinary and cultured citizen, Hansu remained unable to comprehend why he was placed on par with those whom he considered lesser. He questioned whether others also perceived this as a misjudgment, but the silence that met his pondering was a testament to the fact that he had already dispatched those individuals. He reflected that these individuals had been quite vocal while alive, but he had let their voices fade into oblivion, attributing it to the cruel twists of fate that befell them. A flicker of satisfaction played on his face, for the time had finally come to face the so-called Demon King. As he made his way through the corpses of various demons, he approached a gateway leading to the throne room of the Demon King. This world he found himself in was one ruled by the mightiest, a utopia for the strong where savagery reigned. Hansu, the hero chosen by the inhabitants of this realm, was hailed as the Apostle of Justice, though he himself had no say in acquiring such a title. The native inhabitants had summoned him as the legendary hero destined to save mankind from the clutches of the Demon King. With a forceful kick, Hansu burst into the throne room, where the Demon King sat arrogantly upon his seat. The Demon King was an imposing figure, tall, dark-skinned and humanoid, yet devoid of any humanity. Two horns adorned his head, complementing his long white hair. His eyes, a fierce shade of red, stared back at Hansu with unwavering confidence. A thick fur cape draped over his shoulders marked him as none other than the fearsome Demon King. A self-assured smile graced his lips as he acknowledged that Hansu had finally made his way to the throne room, addressing him as the chosen hero. Hansu, in turn, questioned the authenticity of his identity, prompting the Demon King to confirm that he was indeed the embodiment of evil, the ruler destined to plunge the world into darkness, per Donar the Demon King. Hanzu's grin widened as he observed the Demon King's grand entrance. His excitement was palpable, akin to someone about to board a train back to Earth. Pedoner, intrigued and impressed by Hansu's demeanor, acknowledged that the fire in his eyes, fueled by an insatiable thirst for victory, pleased him. He expressed his readiness to take on the challenge presented by humanity, However, before Pedoner could continue speaking, Hansu interjected, voicing a query he had long held within him. He inquired why Pedoner had stood idly by while his subordinates perished over the span of a decade. Pedoner, the Demon King, displayed a furrowed brow and retorted that his consistent approach had been to dispatch increasingly formidable subordinates in pursuit of revenge. Hansu interjected, his voice carrying a tone of assertion, pointing out that these subordinates had met their end. Pedoner, Undeterred, explained that he escalated his efforts by sending even more potent underlings. Hansu's retort was swift, emphasizing that this cycle had repeated itself, resulting in the death of these new subordinates as well. Annoyance flickered across Pedoner's features, his patience waning due to these frequent interruptions. He questioned whether Hansu was dissatisfied with having survived purely by chance. In response to Pedoner's question, Hansu argued that if the Demon King had taken action from the outset, his interference would have prevented Hansu from reaching their current confrontation. Hansu went on to elaborate that Pedoner's strategy had backfired, resulting in the loss of numerous subordinates and assets over the past decade. With each defeat, Hansu asserted, he had grown stronger. Thus, he asserted that Pedoner unwittingly had played a significant role in nurturing his development. Growing increasingly frustrated, Pedoner retorted that Hansu's assumptions were baseless and urged him to refrain from speaking on matters he did not understand, the intricacies of demon politics. Hanzu's inner monologue acknowledged the futility of his words in attempting to pierce through Pedoner's perspective. The question that had plagued him for ten years would remain unanswered until the very end. Yet, as Hansu neared the climax of this encounter, it became clear that his escape from this brutal fantasy realm was imminent, and he would return to Earth as a cultured citizen. As both combatants readied themselves, activating their full powers and lunging towards each other, a resounding uproar echoed through the surroundings. In the aftermath, Pedoner lay battered and broken, his form embedded in the wall, and Hansu stood triumphant before him, his sword unsheathed. It was evident that Hansu had gained the upper hand through those years of unwavering endurance. His resolve had not been in vain. However, Pedoner, injured and on the brink of demise, posed a question to Hansu. He inquired if Hansu's overwhelming strength was fueled by the anguish of losing his comrades. Hansu's response was resolute. He denied any connection between his strength and his companion's loss, attributing it instead to the results of his rigorous training. With a scoff and a final exhalation, Pedoner acknowledged the remarkable nature of their clash and met his end. 
As life left Pettiner, Hansu found himself momentarily puzzled. However, his confusion was soon replaced by an almost maniacal laughter of triumph. He proclaimed to the god of the fantasy world that he had fulfilled his promise by slaying the demon king, and he implored to be returned to his home on Earth. Happiness surged within him as he looked forward to his impending return, a prospect that held the promise of reuniting with his parents, enjoying life's simple pleasures, and more importantly, embracing modern conveniences such as flushing toilets. Amid his euphoria, a mysterious figure emerged, casting a shadow over his elation. She questioned whether Hansu had enjoyed his adventure, jolting him out of his reverie. Bewildered by her sudden presence, he pressed for her identity and asked if she was the ultimate hidden antagonist. She swiftly denied this, explaining that she had been a silent observer, a divine presence watching over the hero during his ten-year journey. She revealed herself as the god of the fantasy world itself, a guardian and guide. With Hansu's head still spinning, the enigmatic figure elucidated that the path of a true hero was arduous, filled with trials that forged bonds of friendship, love, and hope. She commended Hansu for his achievements and directed his attention to a report card of sorts. Displayed before him was an assessment of his attributes. S rank for combat power, a rank for achievements, D plus for reputation, and F for character. Below these rankings was a damning inquiry, questioning his rationale for hurting his own comrades. Suddenly, the faces of his dead comrades, Jiang Hui, Yu Zhan Wang, Hai Anja, and Yang Baiyang Wang, flashed before his eyes. A chilling truth emerged. Before defeating the demon king Pedimnar, Hansu had turned on his comrades, those who had journeyed with him. They had inadvertently obstructed his path, and in a violent outburst of revenge, he had ambushed and slaughtered them. Hansu's voice trembled as he justified his actions, recounting the unfair treatment he had suffered due to their interference, the indignities he had endured, and the sense of violation. He painted a picture of companions who had crossed boundaries and jeopardized his well-being, even citing an instance where Jiangui had carelessly exposed her unclothed body and wielded a weapon against him. In his view, his retaliation had been just. However, the shadowy figure interjected, denouncing his actions as a failure. She revealed that his potent abilities were incongruous with his personality and moral compass. She emphasized the responsibility that came with great power and for the sake of maintaining world order and peace, she asserted that Hansu needed to return to the beginning of the trial. Overwhelmed by the turn of events, Hansu protested, questioning the notion of a retest and the imposition of world order. He questioned the validity of the figure's intentions, arguing that even if she were a deity, she couldn't manipulate him in such a manner. He expressed his resistance to the idea of returning to a world that lacked flushing toilets and where the comrades he had slain would be alive once more. Suddenly, an enigmatic mark materialized beneath his feet, engulfing him in its grip and erasing his presence. As his consciousness wavered, a disembodied voice declared that the faculty and teaching staff were united in prayer for his success. The voice revealed that professional instructors had been dispatched and Hansu was now designated as the trash hero. A fragment of memory from a decade ago flooded Hansu's mind, transporting him back to his classroom, where he engaged in a lively conversation with his friends about their fantasies. Among them, one friend envisioned leaving behind their studies to journey into a fantasy realm, intent on rescuing a princess abducted by a malevolent demon king and eventually marrying her. Another friend shared dreams of embarking on a thrilling adventure with enchanting beings from various races. Meanwhile, another harbored aspirations of world domination through the development of potent nuclear weapons. Another friend playfully interjected, suggesting the possibility of utilizing a forbidden ten-circle magic in the fantastical realm. The former dismissed this notion, jesting that such an idea was too nerdy. Instead, he staunchly asserted that martial arts originating from the world of martial practitioners held the pinnacle of appeal. Amid the spirited exchange, their attention naturally turned to Hansu. With curiosity, they probed what aspirations he harbored for a fantasy world. Yet, in an instant, a brilliant and overwhelming ray of light surged to life, snatching him away. It was a sudden departure that marked his final interaction with his friends before his fateful summons. Now, Hansu found himself re-emerging in the very spot from a decade ago. He gazed at the unfamiliar mark from which he had been summoned, realizing that it wasn't a dimension transfer, instead, it was the magic circle of hero abduction. His appearance had reverted to that of his younger self from a decade earlier, devoid of any equipment or possessions. All that remained were his memories from the past ten years. Frustration clenched his jaw as he grappled with the realization that an entire decade, 3650 days and 87,600 hours, had passed. It was an expanse of time during which a child could have been born and seen off to school or a student could have completed university. Amid his internal turmoil, a lovely young girl named Lanouvel broke his reverie as she approached, addressing him as Hironim. Intrigued, Han Su contemplated how, during his initial summoning, she had been the one to speak first. 
an archaeologist and summoner responsible for his arrival. She inquired if he had regained his senses, to which he curtly denied. Her flustered reaction to his response hinted at his evident bewilderment after being summoned so abruptly. Lenouvel proceeded to explain the nature of their current location. Fantasia, a dimension distinct from Hansu's original world. Following their exchange, Hansu summarized his understanding. The demon king Pebnonar had awakened, heralding calamity for humanity, and the prophecy hero, Hironim, was summoned to save the world. Lenouvel commended his insight, confirming his accuracy. After all, he had already experienced the epilogue, having vanquished the demon king Pedinar. She then introduced herself as Lenouvel, an archaeologist who had discovered the prophecy during her quest to unravel ancient legends. She had summoned him and revealed that Lenouvel translated to truth in the ancient tongue. Blushing slightly, Hansu mused that even after a decade, Lenouvel's appearance remained captivating. He marveled at the idea that he, a pubescent child ten years prior, still found her stunning. Abruptly, he advised her against flashing a bright smile and fiending cuteness, finding it irritating. He questioned if she derived amusement from seeing someone who was living a humdrum life suddenly being kidnapped. Was her urge to burst into laughter triggered solely by his presence? He chided her, noting the irony that her name's meaning didn't align with her behavior. Lenouvel's complexion paled and she stammered an apology in response to his pointed remarks. In an instant, a heavily armored guard entered and informed Hansu of the king's waiting. Hansu's nonchalant reply about waiting too left both Lenouvel and the guard in astonishment. They were taken aback by his casual attitude towards meeting the king. Hansu, on the other hand, couldn't understand why they were so surprised. After all, he was the sole hero capable of defeating the demon king in that world. He couldn't help but smirk, emphasizing that there was no one else but him who could achieve such a feat. With his characteristic confidence, he asserted that the world would have met its end without his intervention. Seating himself comfortably, Hansu didn't hesitate to express his impatience. He demanded that if the king wanted to meet him, he should hurry up and not test his patience. In his typical straightforward manner, he suggested that if they had any issues, they could attempt to defeat the demon king themselves. With a playful grin, Hansu reveled in his own clever remark as the guard hastened to deliver his message to the king. The situation seemed to amuse him. However, the lighthearted atmosphere took an unexpected turn as a soft yet commanding voice echoed around him. The voice urged him to humble himself, invoking an old saying about hidden gems. It conveyed that those who elevated themselves would eventually be humbled, while those who remained humble could rise to greatness. Intrigued and slightly confused by the voice, Hansu turned his attention to a mysterious figure materializing before him. This figure was a slender girl adorned with a mask and a cascade of light-colored hair. She introduced herself as the special instructor, explaining that she had been dispatched due to his personality's F-score. She promised to aid him in transforming into a brave hero, even putting her own instruction qualifications on the line to emphasize her commitment. Hansu found himself caught off guard by her sudden appearance and her role as a special instructor. He wondered if they had encountered each other during his previous summoning, though he couldn't recall such an encounter. Curiosity got the better of him, and he asked for clarification about her identity. She explained the rarity of a special instructor's involvement, how heroes who succeeded the test weren't usually aware of their presence, and how even failed heroes often retake the test without noticing them. Hansu's frustration grew as he began to grasp that the special instructor was essentially an observer sent to interfere with his actions. He couldn't help but feel that this was adding another layer of unfairness to the situation. Voicing his frustration, he demanded to know the purpose of her interference, especially since he had successfully vanquished the demon king. From his perspective, his conquest had been flawless, leaving no loose ends. However, the special instructor's response threw him for a loop. She indicated that his success was precisely the problem, setting the stage for a new phase of his journey that he hadn't anticipated. As per the special instructor's revelation, Hansu, who had deliberately repeated his mistakes, was meant to face a harsh defeat at the hands of the Demon King, yet he emerged triumphant. The age-old adage that failure was the mother of success seemed inapplicable here, for Hansu hadn't truly experienced failure, and hence lacked the incentive to reflect on his actions. The instructor's intentions became clear to Hansu, prompting him to question whether she was implying that he hadn't introspected enough. Her response affirmed his suspicion, emphasizing that virtuous individuals were akin to water, peaceful and universally beneficial. Her final words as she faded into the void expressed eagerness to witness Hansu's transformation into a profound and expansive ocean, one that genuinely cared for his comrades. With a hint of anticipation, she declared the theoretical lesson concluded, making way for practical lessons that would commence the next day. 
Returning to the present, Hansu, visibly perturbed, contemplated that it might have been simpler to engage in a physical confrontation with the Demon King than to grapple with the intricacies of true camaraderie. Amid his inner turmoil, Lanuval observed his odd behavior and inquired about any physical discomfort resulting from the untested dimensional transfer magic. She urged him to promptly inform her if he experienced any unusual bodily sensations. Hansu privately reasoned that sharing his concerns wouldn't alleviate them. The Academy's teaching staff consisted of mentors who cultivated heroes, but he couldn't shake the feeling that they were essentially kidnapping ordinary individuals and molding them into heroes through intensive training. Though their intentions weren't obviously malicious, he couldn't discern their true motives. They could terminate him easily since he had been sent back after defeating the Demon King, unless they were content with his actions. As he weighed these thoughts, he decided to cooperate temporarily, seeking an alternative when circumstances became clearer. Hansu stood up and requested Le Nouvel's guidance to meet the king. Navigating through the corridors, Hansu strategized his approach, recognizing that his initial confrontation with the king was essentially a contest for control. With no ties binding him to the country or the king, he intended to assert his rights as a human being. However, mindful of the precarious balance between his actions and the survival of the world he was in, Hansu aimed to strike a reasonable compromise reminiscent of a balanced relationship between employer and employee. Yet he couldn't help but harbor a strong disdain for the seemingly useless king who enjoyed exerting authority. His thoughts were momentarily disrupted as a guard fixed a stern gaze on him, cautioned Hansu about his words in the king's presence. Rather than being cowed, Hansu queried a smirk, challenging the guard's glare and asserting his unique role as the sole hope to defeat the demon king. He boldly questioned the repercussions even if he happened to be mistaken in his assertion. Suddenly, a resonant and haughty voice cut through the air, expressing admiration for Hansu's audacity. The voice was followed by a swift, almost imperceptible strike aimed at Hansu. Swift reflexes allowed Hansu to evade the attack, but the voice itself sent shockwaves through his mind. This encounter was an anomaly and unexpected twist that he hadn't anticipated. His anxiety surged, questioning why this man was present at this moment, an occurrence that shouldn't have transpired. The man before him was none other than Alex, the palace knight captain, a figure Hansu couldn't have imagined encountering at this juncture. In his current seemingly vulnerable state, Hansu couldn't afford to face Alex head-on. This brazen man who previously wielded power over him had transformed into a colossal threat. Alex justified his reckless act as a test of courage, but Hansu knew better. In this world of savagery where innocents were abducted and subjected to violence, Alex was but a pawn in a cycle of oppression. Yet Hansu had evolved since his last encounter with Alex. Drawing a pen from his pocket, Hansu struck at Alex's thighs with precision, tearing his pants and eliciting shock from all witnesses. Though his physical prowess was diminished, Hansu's experience as a seasoned hero granted him a formidable advantage. Tauntingly, Hansu insinuated that he had almost castrated Alex with his attack, further stoking Alex's fury. This bold action held a deeper satisfaction for Hansu. Retribution for the humiliation he had endured during his initial summoning orientation. Alex, who had once treated Hansu like a dog, was now faced with a stark reminder of his past transgressions. In a state of panic, Lanuval swiftly ordered Alex to extend an apology to Hansu. In a counter move, Alex displayed his torn pants, using the ripped fabric as evidence of his own suffering, effectively turning the situation into a shared ordeal. Hansu couldn't help but smirk at the sight, reveling in Alex's discomfiture. Yet their exchange didn't end there. Alex, bearing a grin, teased Hansu about his frail frame, dubbing him an assassin. Their banter escalated as Alex swore an oath in his honor that if Hansu were to prevail in their future contest, he would kneel and formally apologize. Hansu's mockery added fuel to the fire, taunting Alex to swear on his two balls. The infuriated Alex stormed off, leaving Hansu to ponder the consequences of their interaction. It was a moment of relief in venting, a release of the pent-up frustration from his initial summing. Hansu contemplated whether this encounter was a blessing or a curse, perhaps a sign that he could relieve some of the accumulated stress from his past experiences. The fact remained that while his powers had vanished upon his return to the past, his strength hadn't waned. His ten years of relentless effort shouldn't have been nullified so easily. As the grand gates to the king's hall swung open, Hansu and the others entered. Hansu couldn't help but thought to himself that the king, with his round and plump face, resembled a dumpling. It was rumored that the king had been a warrior in his youth known for his warlike character. However, the man who once led armies into battle was now a rotund monarch sporting a crown. Hansu casually surveyed his surroundings and couldn't help but notice the multitude of irritated expressions among the courtiers and guards. His brief observation was interrupted by one of the guards, who reminded him that he was in the presence of his majesty, a king. 
Reflecting on his past, Hansu remembered how he had greeted the king with respect during his first summon. Now, however, he questioned the necessity of currying favor with the king, who would likely meet an untimely end as history repeated itself. While Hansu pondered his choices, the king anticipated a formal greeting from the hero. Suddenly, the voice of the special instructor echoed in Hansu's mind, instructing him to show humility. She expressed her eagerness to see him evolve into a vast and profound ocean. Irritated but determined, Hansu clenched his teeth and bowed. That day's lesson was modesty, and he vowed to become that vast ocean and engulf them all. He greeted the king with respect, introducing himself as Kang Hansu and thanking him for his gracious hospitality. Those present were astounded by his unexpectedly polished manners, given the preconceived notion that he would be a crude barbarian. Little did they know that his past ten years had forced him to become well-versed in customs and culture. The king, too, was pleasantly surprised by Hansu's courteous greeting and commended Laravel for her diligent work. The king then inquired if Hansu could display his abilities. Hansu obliged, activating his status screen. However, as he examined it, he realized that nothing had changed from his first summon. He had learned from experience that repeating actions led to skill acquisition and proficiency could increase the efficiency and power of those skills. Just like in the previous summon, his interpretation A was assigned to a normal skill. But there was something new as well. The F in Fortitude and Assassin had been added to his status. Hansu couldn't help but wonder if this was due to the courage test initiated by the Swordmaster, Alex. Frustration boiled within him, realizing that everything, from his level to his skills, had been reset. Nonetheless, he calmly informed the king of his status, declaring his job as a hero at level 1. When questioned about the specifics of his hero job, Hansu explained the 500% experience bonus, leaving the king and everyone present astonished. The noisy reactions didn't surprise him, for regardless of his talent, growing five times faster than others was undeniably impressive. Lenuval herself was awed by his 500% experience bonus, recognizing it as a remarkable feat. The king wasted no time in presenting the dire state of the country, emphasizing the looming crisis due to its proximity to the demon territory. He issued a firm command for Hansu to defeat the demon king, Pedonor, after eradicating the demons and homing his skills. Hansu couldn't help but feel annoyed by the king's myopic perspective. He knew that the country's problems ran deeper than just the demon king. Silently, he chided the king not to place all the blame on the demons and to open his eyes to the bigger picture. In his mind, the king was nothing more than a figurehead, a dumpling king who couldn't even serve as a stew ingredient. Suppressing his inner frustration, Hansu posed a question about the support he would receive. He asked the king politely, masking his true feelings. The king's reply, however, left no room for doubt. He asserted that they had summoned Hansu to save their country, and that this was the greatest support they could offer. Hansu's modesty crumbled in an instant, and he flatly refused to cooperate. He brazenly suggested that they find another hero. His response left everyone in the room astounded, but Hansu wasn't done. He criticized their approach, asserting that they should be on their knees, begging him for help rather than issuing commands. He even went so far as to mockingly address the king as the Dumpling King, emphasizing that he was not a citizen of their country. His insolence triggered the ire of one of the men in the crowd, who lunged at Hansu, demanding to know how he dared to speak to the king in such a manner. In a swift motion, Hansu hurled his pen, striking the man's forehead and causing him to cry out in pain. Hansu realized that he couldn't employ the same lethal force as he once could, but he remained unfazed. As the guards rushed forward, poised to attack him, Hansu fearlessly invited them to try to hurt him if they could. He moved closer to them, questioning the king's logic. He pointed out that if the king were to die, the prince could take his place, and if the prince were lost, the princess could step in. But he challenged them to answer who would replace the hero if he were to perish, and how they would ever hope to vanquish the demon king without him. Hansu's inner thoughts swirled with disdain as he contemplated the absurdity of treating these people with modesty. To him, they were like pigs that would return once left to their own devices. Summoning him to save their country and considering it their greatest support was, in his view, as ridiculous as driving a dog to a hunting ground and expecting it to hunt without assistance. He frowned, thinking about the comparisons they made between him and the Demon King. To his surprise, he found Pedinar, the Demon King, to be a more honorable adversary. Every time Hansu defeated one of Pedinar's subordinates, he was duly rewarded, as he always claimed their belongings. Unlike the kingdom's empty promises, Pedimoner never left him empty-handed. Hansu couldn't help but feel that these people could never truly threaten him. Even if there was a small risk of him perishing, he cared little about whether the fantasy world collapsed or not. With confidence and a touch of arrogance, Hansu turned to the king and inquired if he had something to say. This audacity irked the king, who retorted by reminding Hansu that he had summoned him to protect the country. He mentioned procuring magic catalysis from various sources, commanding Laravel to summon him. 
In the king's eyes, Hansu was now a possession of the kingdom, and he declared it with fervor. Hansu countered with a biting analogy, comparing himself not to a possession, but to a hero. He scoffed at the notion that the king could announce him as the kingdom's possession and see how the world reacted. He issued a veiled threat, warning that once the truth came out about how they oppressed the hope of humanity, the kingdom's fate, including that of its supporters, would be sealed. The proclamation left everyone in stunned silence. After a moment, the king composed himself and inquired about the kind of support Hansu desired. Hansu wasted no time listing his demands. Top quality food, shelter, clothing, equipment, potions, a military map, diplomatic immunity, room service, and most importantly, money. He justified his requests with the belief that a role-playing game that had already been cleared would inevitably become boring. Therefore, he had decided to use the cheat key and tread the path of luxury and ease. Some time later, the special instructor found herself once again in the position of lecturer in Hansu, who had managed to cause yet another incident within a single day. She began her lecture with an unusual analogy, asking Hansu if he had ever heard of a pig that, when bought with a credit card, would incessantly oink. She likened this to his situation, explaining that the king who had provided him with financial support would continue making endless demands, akin to the pig's constant oinking. She emphasized the importance of choosing a less favorable compromise over pursuing a more favorable but risky lawsuit urging him to understand that even if he had the power to win, sometimes it was better to endure a loss. With a sigh, she lamented that if she had more time, she would have preferred to interfere from the outside, but her duties were currently tied up with waves of students. This remark puzzled Hansu, prompting him to inquire about these other students. She clarified that he wasn't the sole hero candidate. There were many students who had already graduated and they had returned safely to Earth, leading happy lives while assisting their neighbors. Before leaving, she advised Hansu to try harder, and this revelation left him feeling tense. He realized that he was not the only human who had crossed over into this world, and he couldn't help but wonder if they used people with a peculiar mindset, like the 8th grader syndrome, from Earth to train them into heroes using practice rooms. As he sank into his bed, he grappled with the bizarre nature of this educational facility designed for a single person but operating on a dimensional scale that defied his sense of reality. Amidst his inner turmoil, Lenouville suddenly appeared innocently inquiring if something was bothering him. Startled and flustered by her abrupt presence, Hansu quickly jumped out of bed and sternly requested that she not approach him so suddenly. As he blushed, she couldn't help but think about how she had been sticking close to him since yesterday, except when he slept. In the past, such a situation might have made his heart race, but now it only added to his confusion. Hansu questioned Lenouville's certainty that he was the only hero summoned to this world. She reaffirmed that he was indeed the sole hero. A special instructor had mentioned that she was preoccupied due to a surge of students. Despite this, an abundance of heroes was embarking on journeys to defeat the Demon King. Yet within this world, Hansu stood as the sole hero. This revelation stirred Hansu's thoughts about parallel worlds. He contemplated whether there existed as many fantasy worlds identical to this one as there were students, akin to an online role-playing game designed for solo enjoyment. After much internal struggle, he resolved to find a way to return to Earth as quickly as possible. If the graduates who had returned were leading happy lives, there was no reason he couldn't do the same. Turning to Laravel, he commanded her to follow him. With a sly smirk, he acknowledged that he now had considerable support at his disposal and intended to use it without hesitation. Moments earlier, the king had proposed a condition to Hansu. Before granting him access to the national treasure and providing financial support, Lanuville would be tasked with managing all the funds allocated to the hero. Hansu remained composed, contemplating whether he should simply overlook this arrangement, given that he might have made a similar decision if he were in the king's shoes. Afterward, Hansu and Lenouville strolled through the bustling streets of the kingdom. Lenouville's gaze fixated on a mesmerizing magical crystal orb, and she couldn't hide her fascination. She expressed her desire to purchase it, explaining that it had been a long-standing wish of hers. Initially, Hansu had doubts about whether the king had selected the right person to oversee him, but after a quick check of the price tag, he readily granted her permission to buy it. As they continued exploring, Hansu couldn't help but notice the abundance of gadgets and wares on display. It was evident that this place was the kingdom's bustling trading hub, where the finest merchandise arrived but came with hefty price tags due to high street taxes. Among the numerous products, those labeled with the word magic commanded the highest prices, much like how cutting-edge technology fetched a premium back on Earth. Without hesitation, Hansu urged Lenouville to keep up as they navigated through the market. Upon arriving in a clothing store, Hansu decided it was time to part ways with his school uniform as it was drawing too much unwanted attention. Emerging from the changing room, he was ready to receive Lenouville's compliments, but her reaction was one of sheer astonishment. 
He had donned an outfit complete with puffy sleeves and pants, a long flowing blue cape akin to that of a noble, and an oversized hat adorned with feathers. Lenouville was utterly dumbfounded, attempting to muster words of praise. However, Hansu intervened with a knowing grin, reassuring her that she didn't need to flatter him. He was fully aware that his chosen attire was a fashion disaster. Nonetheless, he clarified that comfort was his main concern on the shopping excursion. After stepping out of the clothing shop, Hansu and Lenouvel continued their stroll through the bustling streets. The locals couldn't help but cast curious glances at Hansu, bedecked in his splendid attire, and some even went as far as to assume he was a noble scion hailing from a prestigious family. A satisfied grin crept across Hansu's face. Everything was unfolding according to his cunning plan. He had counted on the notion that common folks wouldn't dare to engage in an argument with someone they perceived as nobility. Amidst this picturesque scene, Lenouvel inquired about their destination. She noted that Hansu had seemingly overlooked the famous blacksmith's shop and the renowned medicinal herbs emporium. Hansu, however, replied bluntly and without hesitation, Black Market. The shock on Lenouvel's face was palpable, and she questioned whether the esteemed and righteous hero intended to participate in illegal auctions. Hansu's retort was swift and to the point. It reminded her that the magical orb she had just purchased was technically illegal given that she had acquired it out of selfish desire. As Level struggled to find her words, Hansu drove the point home. They were none other than accomplices in this venture. Upon hearing his explanation, Lendevil's expression shifted from one of dread to a calm, knowing smile. She admitted that after much thought, if visiting the black market could contribute to achieving world peace, then perhaps it was justifiable, especially considering that deadly poisons were used in medicines as well. She went on to ask how they would locate the black market, given its elusive nature, where the location changed continually. Hansu pondered that it might raise suspicion if a newly summoned hero had more knowledge of the black market than a native. He cleverly seared the conversation, questioning whether a hero could truly be a hero if they were ordinary. He argued that if he, the chosen hero, could defeat the Demon King with only a 500% experience bonus, then the ancient fairies and dragons living for thousands of years would have done so already. He emphasized that a hero's true worth extended beyond their abilities. Lenouvel, swayed by his eloquence, decided to follow his lead. Despite Hansu's knowledge, even he was unaware of the black market's precise location. However, he knew they could find out if they visited the pub where he had been a regular during his previous summon. Upon entering the pub, they were greeted by a raucous commotion. Revelers were engaged in various activities from drinking and fighting to singing and more. Nothing had changed since Hansu's return to the past. The pub was just as lively as ever. Hansu beckoned the bartender, Tony. Looking bewildered, he inquired if Hansu knew him, to which Hansu replied affirmatively, stating that he was quite familiar with Tony. Tony had been a former assassin who transitioned into running a pub upon retiring. During Hansu's first summon, Tony had played a crucial role in teaching him how to survive in that fantasy world, establishing a strong bond of friendship and mentorship between them. On this particular day, Hansu hadn't come to rekindle their friendship, though, Tony expressed his delight in seeing a customer accompanied by such a lovely companion in his pub and proceeded to inquire about their beverage preferences. While Hansu pondered that things were different from his last visit, he wondered if the language of promise would still work. He suddenly posed a question to Tony. Did good liquor arrive today? This cryptic statement immediately captured Tony's attention. Tony calmly replied that he would provide the liquor if Hansu paid the price he desired. It seemed the language of promise was still effective. Tony went on to recommend a 27-year-old stout black dragon liquor that had arrived that day. He suggested that it paired exquisitely with grilled sheep meat, making the flavors truly come to life. Through subtle wordplay, Hansu deduced that the next black market event was scheduled for that very day and black dragon was the exact location. Tony provided additional hints depending on the direction in which he poured the liquor. Hansu couldn't resist asking one more question. He inquired about the quality of the mutton. Tony assured him it was grilled mutton, something he could look forward to. Despite being illegal in the kingdom, the primary commodity traded in the black market was slaves. With a confident grin, Hansu instructed Tony to maintain the order as is mutton for two. After leaving the pub, Hansu hastily strode ahead, leaving Lenouvel baffled by his sudden urgency. Annoyed, Hansu sharply gestured at her, chiding her for the delay. He complained that they had taken the time to enjoy a meal after securing their spot for the auction, that she had kept adding extra orders, blaming her for their tardiness, due to her insistence that the mutton was too greasy. Flustered, Lenouvel attempted to change the subject by inquiring about Tony and whether Hansu knew him. Hansu replied that to the public eye, Tony was simply an ordinary bartender. However, for Hansu, he held a special place. 
In his eyes, Tony was the cool friend who had imparted to him the laws of survival in this world, someone with whom, had he not become a hero, he could have even gone into business. Hansu then confided in Laravel, asking her to keep a secret from the king. He revealed that aside from the 500% experience bonus, he possessed another unique ability, which left Le Nouvel astonished. Since his arrival in this world, he could not only see his own stats, but also those of everyone else. This, he believed, was a safeguard for hero candidates in their early stages, preventing them from picking fights with overwhelmingly powerful individuals. In the second round, his ability still remained, and as a hero, he considered it natural to possess such a skill to assess tough situations at a glance. Surprised yet intrigued by his revelation, Le Nouvel asked if he could see her level as well. She stared at him inquisitively as he examined her status. It indicated her level at 200, her job as a scholar, and her skills. Magic A, Sorcery A, Charm B, Cooking B, and Immortality slash Eternal Youth C. Hansu, deep in thought, noted that despite her level being 200, she couldn't even measure up to the lowest followers of the Demon King. Yet individuals like her with high ratings and potential were truly formidable. With an abrupt turn, Hansu left her puzzled, wondering about his sudden change in behavior. Just as Lenouvel approached him, a man with malicious intent suddenly materialized behind her, wielding a knife and slightly sliced her money bag from her waist. Lenouvel let out a piercing scream as the thief swiftly grabbed the bag and made a break for it. Her magical orb, still attached to her waist, began to slip, but Hansu reacted with lightning speed, snatching it from midair and hurling it like a missile toward the fleeing thief. The orb struck the thief's back with force, sending him crashing to the ground. Hansu calmly pointed out that the spot between the fourth and fifth lumbar vertebrae known as the waist disc was a frequent area of injury. If left untreated, it could lead to chronic waist pain and numbness in the legs, making daily life increasingly challenging. The thief, after regaining his footing, stood up, clutching the knife as Hansu discreetly examined his status. The thief's level was a mere 8, with skills rated at Sight E, Escape F, and Murder of Hansu, had regained his physical strength upon being summoned, but it was only effective to a certain degree for using tools as projectiles. There was a seven-level difference in their physical abilities. Hansu taunted the thief, suggesting that he hand over the money bag and flee, as he was willing to overlook the incident. Enraged by Hansu's audacity, the thief issued a menacing threat, warning Hansu not to underestimate him. With a swift motion, the thief lunged at Hansu, calmly removed his hat, extended his hand in front of him, and positioned it to obscure the thief's vision with the feathered adornment from the hat. Without further delay, Hansu met over behind the thief and expertly snapped his neck with a barehanded strike. As the thief fell lifeless to the ground, Hansu explained that the area between the sixth and seventh lumbar vertebrae was another common source of trouble. Students and office workers often suffer from herniated cervical discs due to prolonged sitting. To avoid the agony of numb arms and a stiff neck, frequent care of this area was crucial. Hansu concluded by remarking that the thief had met his demise for daring to challenge him. After a while, the guards arrived to remove the thief's lifeless body, and Le Nouvel assured Hansu that his identity as a hero remained a secret. However, Hansu couldn't shake the feeling that rumors might circulate within the kingdom in the coming days. He believed it would have been easier to move forward if they could erase all traces of the incident. Suddenly, Lanouville remarked that he seemed experienced with hurting, which startled him. He vehemently forbade her from equating him with murderers. Over the course of ten years, he had gained experience through various challenges, making it a habit to eliminate those who posed a threat without hesitation. Hansu inquired about the average level of an adult man, to which he provided the answer himself, stating it was typically level three. He offered an example, explaining that if a farmer were armed, they might gain an additional two levels. However, the thief who had attacked him possessed a level of eight, Upon inspecting the thief's skills, Hansu deduced that he was neither a former hunter nor a soldier. As he continued to discuss this, Lanouvel interjected, reaching the same conclusion that Hansu had recognized the crimes committed by the thief, including the murder of many civilians. Therefore, Hansu believed the likelihood of the thief harming another victim had been eliminated. Lanouvel praised his bravery, expressing her confidence that even before defeating the demon king, he would protect the peaceful lives of the kingdom's residents. She considered this Hansu's first remarkable achievement. She also asked if his level had increased, and upon inspection, Hansu discovered that his level had risen from one to four. Lanouvel explained that in this realm, every creature carried power within them. Some grew stronger as they matured, but most augmented their power by stealing it, often through acts of violence. Hansu contemplated whether this system, where one grew stronger by committing more hurtings, truly resembled a fantasy setting. He found himself surprisingly exhilarated by his first hunt, he advised Laravel to take good care of the money bag, 
unaware of the mysterious woman who had been eavesdropping on their conversation. Hansu and Lenouvel found themselves navigating through a dimly lit ominous alleyway. Suddenly, a man sporting a white suit and a black vest materialized before them, inquiring if Hansu was a customer of Tony's. Hansu responded, not just a customer, but an archenemy of Tony's. The man seemed unperturbed and gestured for them to follow him. Dealing with the covered dealings of the black market across the continent was no trifling matter. Their security measures bordered on the paranoid and even Hansu couldn't fully reveal their identities in his first summon. Relief washed over Hansu as the password he had given earlier still appeared to be effective. He followed the man through a labyrinthine route that led to an aged, warped house. Stepping inside, Lenouvel couldn't help but observe that the house had the appearance of a high-ranking general's residence. Hansu directed her gaze downward, where a peculiar mark etched into the floor caught her attention. A spatial transfer magic circle. Hansu remarked the materials required for such a circle must be exorbitantly expensive, a testament to the thoroughness of the black market's operations. Astonished, Lenouvel confessed that she had imagined the black market to be hidden in a more inconspicuous location. The man handed them masks and requested that they put them on. Lenouvel felt a touch of embarrassment, especially with the rabbit mask in her hands. Hansu reassured her, explaining that while some dared to wander the black market without masks, he couldn't afford to do so, considering his imminent reputation as a hero. He then urged the man to hasten their journey to the auction room. With a swift activation of the spatial transfer magic circle, they were whisked away. As they emerged in a dimly lit room, Hansu motioned for Lanuvel to remain silent. He was wary of provoking any hidden guards lurking in the shadows. Hansu was no stranger to this place he had visited during his first summon. It was located beneath the forest, to the west of the capital, a hidden hub occasionally used as a black market. An elderly guard carrying a lamp greeted them and informed them that the auction would commence shortly. He kindly offered to guide them to their reserved seats and explain the rules. If they wished to bid, they should lightly ring the bell in front of their seat. Payment was to be made in advance with coins or jewels, and any problems or losses resulting from removing their masks or revealing their identities would not be their concern. Hansu couldn't resist a playful jab at Lenouvel, addressing her as Miss Extra. She retaliated with a grumble, asserting that she wasn't extra. Hansu promptly covered her mouth to keep her from revealing her name aloud. He knew that Lenouvel, the renowned archaeologist, was considered a beauty in the middle continent of Fantasia, and he couldn't fathom why she would risk revealing her identity at a black market. This announcement instantly captured the attention of all in attendance. The allure of obtaining an untouched noble elf was irresistible. Elves being considered a superior race were the embodiment of human desires in this world, a fact that was hard to dismiss even though they were part of a fantastical realm. The fascination was compounded by their unique characteristics. A lengthy lifespan, exceptionally low fertility, and minimal fun desires, akin to eunuches or monks. Lenouvel chimed in, providing some context about the elves. They had lost the territorial war against humans and retreated to the deepest reaches of the forest, where they had become prey to various dangers. In addition, Lenouvel mentioned something peculiar about the elf. Hansu couldn't help but speculate that Lenouvel also found the elf unusual, given Lenouvel's expertise as a magician. What set this elf apart was her astonishingly high level and impressive 851, accompanied by remarkable skills. Archery A, Agility B, Sight C, Tracking D, and Elements D. Hansu immediately decided to bid on her, recognizing that passing up such an opportunity would be a loss. He pondered whether her level of 851 could compare to that of an intermediate ranked demon, but her superior race would likely compensate for any discrepancy. Additionally, her exceptional skill levels placed her somewhere between middle and high rank, making her comparable to the pet that the Demon King was known to possess. Her status screen resembled a medical chart, revealing that she was afflicted by curses, poison, exhaustion, and anesthesia. The first curse was likely the work of a demon, leaving her physically alive but mentally restrained. The other afflictions were undoubtedly added by the Dark Commerce when they captured her, making her incapable of resistance. Hansu promptly rang the bell to signal his bid, while others in the audience contemplated whether it might be more profitable to hire another warrior instead. Hansu anticipated their line of thinking, suspecting they might hesitate to go all in for an elf of unknown level. The host initiated a countdown from three, with Hansu as the highest bidder. However, just as the countdown commenced, a thunderous explosion erupted, violently shattering the entrance. Hansu swiftly deduced that if the hidden guards couldn't halt this intrusion, it signified a full-blown invasion. Upon closer scrutiny, Hansu detected Earth elements manipulated with magic, leading him to the conclusion that the intruders were undoubtedly elves. Soon after, numerous elves began pouring in through the destroyed entrance, armed and resolute. 
Panic gripped the guards, who frantically issued orders to block the intruders and called for reinforcements. The leader of the invading elves expressed gratitude to the conspicuously dressed noble who stood out like a sore thumb, gesturing toward Hansu, making it clear that she was the suspicious woman who had been eavesdropping on Hansu and Lenuvel during their journey to the auction. The elf leader then ordered her comrades to attack, motivated by the desire to rescue their brethren. The elves acted swiftly, launching their attacks on the guards one by one, yet their only goal was to safeguard their customers. The guards responded with equal determination, diving into the chaotic fray strictly following orders not to leave a single scratch on their assailants, even if they had to take their lives. Then the leader of the elves unleashed her formidable power, elements, and aimed it at the guards, leaving them paralyzed and bewildered. Hansu, astonished by this turn of events, couldn't help but speculate if a member of the royal family had unexpectedly paid a visit to this seedy black market. It was none other than elf queen Sylvia, identified as an arch-elf, her level marked at 284 and her skills listed as Elements S, Elegance A, Charm B, Archery B, and Blessing C. Currently a princess, she was destined to ascend the throne once the Elf King's rule was overturned in a coup d'etat, making her the future Elf Queen. In fact, Sylvia was no stranger to Hansu. She had been part of his previous party, the very girl he had been on during his first summon. Her level was still modest since she hadn't officially joined their party yet, but her innate talents ensured her skills were already at an impressive level. Sylvia unleashed her powers again, efficiently dismantling the guards surrounding her. Amid the chaos, the elderly guide who had led Hansu to the auction earlier appeared and discreetly directed him towards an exit. Hansu couldn't help but admire their commitment to prioritizing the safety of their customers even in the midst of such turmoil. Lenuvel, observing the unfolding situation, asked Hansu if they should assist in the elves' rescue. As their eyes met, Hansu understood her desire to help the elves and impart a lesson to the black market. However, he abruptly ordered her to proceed to the evacuation shelter and await his return. Lenuvel questioned his decision, prompting Hansu to chastise her, expressing disbelief that she would consider abandoning their newfound comrade, who would be an essential part of their future endeavors. They were the only remaining customers yet to escape. With the slaves still bound in shackles, they were caught up in the chaos and lost their lives. Hansu, donning the mantle of the hero, declared his intention to handle the situation personally, instructing Level to take refuge in the evacuation shelter with their new ally. As Level and the mercenary departed, Hansu beckoned the host, questioning whether the elf he had acquired was now in his possession. The host nodded in agreement, acknowledging that the circumstances had essentially guaranteed her as Hansu's property. He went on to emphasize that the elf's life now rested in Hansu's hands, given that she had been anesthetized and posed no resistance. Silently, Hansu commended the auctioneer for his astuteness, recognizing that the elf had been the driving force behind the group of elves. He also understood that the current situation did not favor the elves. With no time to tend to the injured elf, the auctioneer seemed to be transferring the burden to Hansu. Hansu praised the auctioneer's competence, although the auctioneer modestly dismissed the accolades. With a confident smile, the auctioneer suggested that Hansu focus on his other responsibilities. Suddenly, an elf lunged at the auctioneer but he moved swiftly to eliminate any threats. Despite maintaining the facade of a poised entertainer, the auctioneer possessed formidable combat prowess. The black market guards, having completed the evacuation of the customers, joined forces with him in the fight. Hansu began to discern the likely outcome of the situation. He deduced that the future elf queen, Sylvia, would likely be captured and reduced to slavery. Her reduced price would spare her from retribution, and a portion of the auction's earnings would go to the families of the deceased guards. At that moment, Hansu firmly grasped the chin of the enslaved elf and bluntly informed her that Sylvia would surrender if she wished to stay alive. The elf agreed, noting that Sylvia was still a soft child. Hansu recounted Sylvia's refusal to surrender during the battle, highlighting the moment when a wretched executive had taken her hostage. Overwhelmed by guilt for endangering her people, Sylvia had eventually surrendered and been sold into slavery. Suddenly, Hansu removed his mask, taking both the enslaved elf and Sylvia by surprise. Hansu noticed the determination in the enslaved elf's expression, her willingness to sacrifice herself for Sylvia's sake. As he firmly grasped her waist and kissed her gently, he caught her off guard, further leaving Sylvia stunned. In that moment, it was as though the elf's heart had been passed down to him. She closed her eyes, a tear escaping, wishing for Sylvia's happiness and not wanting her to suffer as a slave for even a moment. As Hansu's lips parted from the elf's, she expressed her gratitude, but with a swift and deliberate motion, Hansu rotated the elf's neck, causing her to fall and die instantly. Thanks to the devil's curse, dispatching her was effortless. Having hurted someone of her caliber level 852, Hansu's own level increased from 4 to 165. 
An evil grin of excitement spread across his face as he found the system both twisted and astonishing. Hansu had achieved an astonishing level up in a single swift move by dispatching a level 851 elf. It was a feat that would have taken him a year or more if he had chosen the conventional path of leveling up. This unique system didn't require talent or noble lineage. Instead, it rewarded those who eliminated stronger individuals by any means necessary. It was a tantalizing prospect, suggesting a world where anyone could become powerful with enough effort and a bit of luck. It painted a picture of a beautiful fantasy world teeming with dreams and hopes. Yet, it was a privilege reserved for Hansu alone. The bewildered auctioneer couldn't fathom Hansu's actions and questioned his motives for hurting the elf. Hansu confidently replied that there wouldn't be any issues since he intended to compensate him fairly. Those unaware of the system couldn't comprehend why hurting a slave would be efficient. Typically, having a slave as a subordinate was more advantageous. However, Hansu recognized his unique status as the hero benefiting from a special 5 times experience boost. This made hurting the level 851 elf as efficient as eliminating 5 of them. And there was still an abundance of experience points to be gained. As Hansu contemplated this newfound power, a bolt of blue lightning streaked towards him with incredible speed. Hansu managed to dodge it deftly. It was Sylvia, launching an attack in her anger. She demanded an explanation for his actions against her master, the elf slave. Hansu swiftly leaped from the stage, snatching up a sword lying on the ground. He remarked that it wasn't the kind of heavy sword he preferred, but it would serve its purpose well for rough use before being discarded. With his current level at 165, he could now do things that were once impossible at level 4. He wished for the soul of the elf queen's master to rest in peace, and assured that her sacrifice wouldn't be in vain, as there would never be a situation where the elf princess would be reduced to slavery. With a sudden burst of speed, Hansu charged towards Sylvia and her two subordinates, determined to make his dream come true. Two of Sylvia's loyal followers stepped forward to shield her, drawing their bows and preparing to unleash a volley of arrows. Hansu's agile form effortlessly dodged every incoming arrow, and he closed in on his targets. However, to his dismay, his body didn't respond as he had expected. He had hoped that leveling up would stabilize his movements. Hansu couldn't help but grin slightly as he analyzed one of Sylvia's subordinates mid-air. He noted that her skills seemed to clash with each other, her reaction speed was lacking, and her movements were too predictable. With a swift blow, he beheaded her with his sword, causing her dagger to fall, which he deftly caught. He pondered that if the dagger was indeed her weapon of choice, she should have closed the distance instead of creating it. Either she lacked experience fighting against humans, or she was accustomed to gracefully shooting arrows from a distance. Turning his attention to the second subordinate, who charged at him in anger with her sword, Hansu considered her an even greater fool. He skillfully parried her attack with his dagger, spun his body around her, and closed the gap. In a swift motion, he placed his dagger against her neck, catching her off guard. He delivered a powerful punch to her face, followed by a swift stab with his dagger, ending her life. Suddenly, a massive fire attack targeted him, striking his waist. Hansu quickly realized the source and identified it as a fire-based assault. He turned to find two other female elf warriors with their weapons drawn, ready to converge their fire attack on him. Thinking quickly, he used the lifeless body of the elf girl he had just herded as a shield, absorbing the fiery onslaught. The two remaining elves were left stunned by the unexpected turn of events. Hansu casually informed them that the girl he had thrown at them was still alive. Taking advantage of their distraction, Hansu closed the distance and seized the sword one of the female elves was holding, nonchalantly commenting that he had recently made their acquaintance but would be borrowing the sword for a while. The elf screamed in terror, but her cries were silenced as Hansu swiftly drove the sword through her neck. He couldn't resist a macabre jest, noting that her scream had been quite melodious, suggesting she might have been a good singer, although she would never sing again. Turning his attention to the last surviving female elf, Hansu mentioned that she couldn't die from something as simple as blood loss. After all, if she died of natural causes, the precious experience he was supposed to gain would vanish. Enraged by the loss of her companions, Sylvia angrily demanded that Hansu be herded. Enraged by Hansu's audacious behavior, the elves launched a relentless assault on him. Amidst the chaos, Hansu couldn't help but reflect on the elves' susceptibility to their emotions. Their exceptionally long lifespans meant they lived in close-knit communities for centuries, effectively becoming one big family. While this bond could be a source of strength, it also left them vulnerable when tragedy struck. The deaths of their comrades had thrown them into a frenzy of grief and anger, clouding their judgment, a fact that Hansu found rather amusing. On the other side, the black market guards were diligently blocking the exits and providing cover for the wolf-masked customer, Hansu. As the battle between the elves and the guards raged on, Hansu couldn't help but lament the loss of the experience points he could have gained. 
Suddenly, a thunderous crash interrupted the skirmish and Hansu turned to investigate. It was Sylvia, who had made a dramatic entrance. Despite the dire situation they were in, it was evident that she and her remaining forces were still a formidable threat. Sylvia appeared to be teetering on the edge of despair and Hansu sensed that his survival might depend on leveling up further. This was no time for Coordus. He resolved to fight with the determination to lose a finger or two if necessary. In a cruel twist of fate, as Hansu retrieved his dagger from the fallen elf, another elf approached from behind. With a swift and unexpected stroke, she cleaved through his finger, causing him not only pain but also a surge of irritation. Its exasperated words escaped in a grumble, questioning why she had chosen that exact moment to disrupt his hard-fought victory, adding insult to injury as he struggled to regain his composure. Despite his annoyance, Hansu's reflexes kicked into action without hesitation. The sharp blade of his dagger found its mark once more, ending the life of the elf who had interrupted his moment of triumph. He then absorbed her experience, using it to compensate for the loss of his finger. He then retrieved his severed finger and skillfully reattached it using his magical abilities. Baffled by the situation, Sylvia couldn't help but ask if Hansu was a demon, given the carnage they had both unleashed. In response, Hansu couldn't help but snicker, finding it ironic that she would label him a demon after their joint massacre. Sylvia, once again, found herself as the sole survivor, but this time, the circumstances had changed significantly due to Hansu's intervention. With the guards unable to take hostages, they were powerless to stop Sylvia's rampage and the black market teetered on the brink of utter destruction. The sheer devastation indicated a significant loss of human life, which Hansu could estimate by observing Sylvia's increased level, which had soared to 288. She had gained many levels, but so had he, with his level now standing at 203. In a mocking display, Hansu bowed before her, offering gratitude to the elf who had unwittingly become experience points for his benefit. Furious at his words, Sylvia summoned her earth elementals and forcefully slammed her sword into the ground, vowing that she and Hansu would meet their end right there. The entire auction room trembled as the earth began to crumble, and the guards hastily made their escape to the outside. Hansu scoffed, stating that he understood her intentions but advised her to hold back as the elf corpses were far more valuable to him. The remains of elves were highly prized. Their blood and bones were often used as magic catalysts, symbolizing eternity, akin to how a virgin symbolizes purity. They were dismantled like a butcher preparing meat. Sylvia argued that she couldn't leave behind her fallen comrades and run away. In response, Hansu questioned if she intended to turn that place into a burial ground for everyone. He blamed her for leading her comrades into a hellish situation, ironically referring to it as an ant's nest. In a panic, she retorted that it was all Hansu's fault and called him a demon, insinuating that everything would have been fine if they had won. Hansu dismissed this as a mere nuisance and implored her not to drag her comrades into a battle they weren't prepared to face. The moment Hansu removed his mask and cast it to the ground, the violent shaking and ground collapsing abruptly ceased. Sylvia, bewildered and unable to fathom why this happened, turned to her elementals in search of answers. She questioned them, demanding to know why they weren't following her commands and why they were shielding that so-called demon. Hansu, Seizing the opportunity, Hansu dashed towards her and thrust his dagger into her abdomen. He commented that her elementals deemed him the hero destined to slay the demon king Pedoner, as far more important than her. Sylvia collapsed to the ground, trembling and confused. Hansu continued, explaining that the elementals cherished nature, and if they wished to protect it, they couldn't do so without the hero's triumph over Pedoner. He questioned whether being buried alive and dying would be a worse fate for her. As he drove the dagger deeper into her stomach with his foot, he warned her not to cross his path for a third time. After the intense battle concluded in such a manner, the future elf queen became an unwitting stepping stone for the hero, a peculiar but beneficial end. Some time later, Hansu found himself sitting uneasily before Professor Morals, the special instructor. Annoyed, she inquired if he had indeed massacred the elves. She explained that when revenge and anger combined, they birthed a daughter named Cruelty, a troublesome and challenging presence. Professor Morals further elaborated that good was as weighty as lead while evil was as light as a feather. With this analogy, she emphasized that even if he defeated the Demon King, graduating from this ordeal would be a difficult task. Hansu felt as though a tremendous burden had been thrust upon him, claiming that it was unfair because the aggressive elves had attacked him first. Professor Morals countered his argument, stating that patience led to peace while impatience resulted in regret. She posited that patience and time had more transformative power than sheer strength or anger. Advising him not to rush, she encouraged him to look around him and ask what he saw. Hansu promptly replied, experience, and exclaimed that he could now defeat the Sword King, Alex. Professor Morals cautioned him not to view his weaker comrades as mere sources of experience. 
She used an analogy to illustrate her point, likening it to a dwarf sitting on the shoulder of a giant, allowing the dwarf to see further than the giant alone. She also mentioned that when a priest and a farmer joined forces, their combined knowledge surpassed that of the priest alone. As she left, she assigned Hansu homework, to strive for harmony and a smile, even when dealing with those he might not like. She promised to meet him again in two days. Frustrated, Hansu groaned, daunted by the difficult task ahead. From that moment on, he couldn't help but worry about it. Just then, Lanuval appeared, having overheard his concerns. She inquired about it, but Hansu ignored her, questioning why she was there. She explained that she was there to assist him. Hansu exclaimed in frustration, emphasizing that he had entrusted her with the responsibility of handling all the matters related to the black market. He found it hard to believe that her task of sending the elf corpses back home had been so straightforward that she could return so quickly. With a hint of intimidation, Lanuval replied, assuring him that she had indeed completed everything he had instructed her to do. She mentioned the potential use of elf corpses as magical materials. Hansu, however, reiterated his stance that he couldn't allow these corpses to remain in the clutches of the black market. He was determined to prevent them from being cruelly butchered and sold at exorbitant prices, especially since he had endured so much hardship to obtain them. Additionally, he inquired of Lanuval whether she had taken care of the families of the black market guards who died in the battle, to which Level nodded in agreement. Moving numerous elf corpses from the fifth floor to the royal palace was indeed a significant task. Hansu proceeded to fully utilize the gold in his money bag to purchase the elf corpses at a reasonable price, even paying the black market officials for transportation fees to ensure their safe delivery to the palace. While Hansu was changing his clothes, he further asked Lanuval if the negotiations with the elf king had gone smoothly. She replied that she had conveyed the entire story via the magic orb, and it had gone well. A delegation from the elf country was scheduled to visit the kingdom soon. After finishing changing, Hansu acknowledged that this was an important step because he had spent all of his savings to obtain the elf corpses from the black market. It would be challenging if there were no replacements. As they ventured through the market, both of them purchased cheese rolls. Hansu pondered that being the hero destined to save the world didn't mean citizens would provide free meals, but he found it satisfactory as long as they didn't try to overcharge him. With a mischievous grin, he further thought about how everyone mistook his level as being only level 4. Even the Elf King couldn't have assumed that his daughter had attacked the hero and been herded since there were no witnesses, with all the black market guards wiped out. He had also made sure to inform Manuel that it was a defeat on both sides. Lost in thought and munching on his cheese rolls, Hansu was surprised when Alex came from behind and smacked him on the back, causing his cheese roll to drop. Alex commented on the rumor that Hansu's new profession was an undertaker. Annoyed, Hansu admitted that he had expected such rumors, but considered them a minor problem unworthy of response. Alex then asked about Hansu's business at the kingdom's exclusive training grounds. Although Hansu had no specific business there, he didn't feel it was necessary to answer the question. Alex pointed out that it had been two days since Hansu had become a hero and with a malicious grin, he expressed his anticipation for what was to come. In response, Hansu irritably retorted that he shared the same sentiment. As they glared at each other, Hansu's attention was drawn to Alex's status board, which displayed his level as 291 in skills. Swordsmanship S, Stamina A, Iron Wall B, Resistance B, and Fortitude C. Briefly inspecting Alex's stats, an image of Professor Morals floated into Hansu's mind, reminding him of his homework to build harmony with his comrades. With a big smile on his face, Hansu told Alex that he had indeed changed his job to an undertaker, but for the purpose of building Alex's coffin. This only added fuel to Alex's anger. The Sword King Alex was inherently a tank. Contrary to common belief, possessing exceptional swordsmanship didn't necessarily make someone a great swordsman. In a war, a true swordsman was someone who could protect their allies while effectively eliminating enemies over an extended period. They were individuals who wouldn't become isolated if left behind and could smoothly rejoin the group thanks to their remarkable swordsmanship and endurance. Alex would earn the title Sword King in the future, because he excelled at both shielding his comrades like an impenetrable wall and carrying out solo missions. However, he would soon come to realize that the hero held the highest rank among Sword Kings. As tensions simmered between them, Alex commented that Hansu could defeat the Demon King with his sharp tongue. Recalling his experience from the first round, Hansu admitted that the Demon King had been more skilled in verbal sparring, but this time he was determined to win. Meanwhile, Alex suggested that they could skip these two days and begin their training immediately. He even offered to provide his apology a day earlier if Hansu preferred. This sarcastic comment irritated Hansu, who promptly told Alex to leave, further fueling Alex's anger. 
As Alex departed, Hansu contemplated the need to hide his true level while practicing. He didn't want to raise suspicions, especially with the Elf King. So he planned to act as though he were still at level 4 until he could enter the ancient ruins deep within the forest. He would then claim that he had increased his level during his time there. Hansu commended himself for his cunningness and how he had embraced Professor Morrill's teachings on endurance. In the past, he might have succumbed to rage and retaliated against Alex's provocations, but now he was resilient like water, letting such remarks slide off him. Suddenly, Lenuvo asked about Hansu's plans for the day. He noticed a subtle guardedness in her demeanor, likely stemming from the shocking events at the black market the day before. In response, Hansu inquired about their new comrade, the mercenary he had acquired from the black market. Originally intended to become Hansu's experience, the professor's advice to not see his weaker comrades, as mere experience had led him to consider a different role for the mercenary, that of a luggage carrier. This time, he wouldn't waste his efforts wandering aimlessly in search of ancient civilization relics, he had a specific destination in mind where he could find what he needed. Hansu inquired about the mercenary's recovery, and Lenouvel informed him that the mercenary, now considered a comrade of the hero rather than a slave, was highly motivated. He was consuming food at an astonishing rate and rapidly regaining his strength, much to the shock of the palace chef. This pleased Hansu, as the mercenary's level was remarkably 286. The impact of levels in this survival-style fantasy world was immense, it frustrated Hansu to think that his 10 years of hard-earned levels had been reset during his brief trip to the past. The experience had convinced him that the teaching staff or those behind them could reset his levels and skills at any time. Even with the hero's five times experience boosts, obtaining extraordinary skills required only a little effort, yet they were nothing more than illusions that could vanish when a transcendent got involved. Magic, sorcery, martial arts, elementalism, blessings, and more were not his things. For Hansu, science was the only true power and truth. As Hansu wandered, he contemplated reducing his dependence on equipment as it would lose meaning if confiscated upon his return to Earth. This also applied to the hero-exclusive Holy Sword, as it was highly unlikely that returning heroes would be given portable nuclear weapons. Lenuvel, with excitement in her eyes, asked if Hansu was preparing for an adventure and inquired about their destination. Hansu explained that the journey wouldn't be a short one and suggested they hurry and prepare for the adventure, planning to depart as soon as they received payment from the elven delegation. Hansu preferred comfortable and swift travel, even if it cost more as he believed in buying time and safety with money, a lesson he had learned from his first round. Lanuval mentioned they'd need permission from the king due to the long distance, but Hansu was confident that the king would approve, knowing his desires. As long as Hansu promised to return promptly after finishing his business, the king would grant permission. The question remained whether Alex would accompany them as a surveillance measure. Lenouvel asked if their destination was the ruins, but Hansu denied it with a grin, teasing that they were going to meet a money being. In Hansu's mind, if Tony, the pub bartender, had been his spiritual teacher, then this entity could be considered his physical power mentor. Lenouvel, curious, wondered if it was an elder dragon, but Hansu found it rather disrespectful to compare his mentor to a mere flying lizard. Lenouvel's eyes sparkled as she stared at him, and when he questioned the reason, she found it mysterious that he admired someone given his habit of looking down on everyone like he already knew everything. Hansu bluntly replied that he looked down on people because they deserved it. He mused internally that they couldn't even develop flushable toilets with their fancy magic, so how could he view those who lived amidst filth as equals? Their conversation was interrupted by a kingdom guard rushing toward them, informing Hansu that the king was looking for him because the delegation from the elven country of Elfheim had just arrived. 